Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues. Full room, as, as we had expected, and on top of that, it's webcast. We are very, very happy, honored to have Prime Minister Nicoletta of Italy with us today at Brookings. Um, he has had an excellent visit with the President, I'm told, President Obama, and we hope he will share with us his perspectives on Italy, but beyond Italy, of course, on, on Europe, and of course Europe and, and the entire world economy and on US-Italy relations also. At the time when finally there has been a compromise in Washington that opened up the government again, I think um, I would like to stress that Prime Minister Zaleta's success over the last eight months has shown that how he can bring people together, how he can bring people together in his own party but also across the political spectrum in Italy. And if there is much more hope now in Italy, and if uh, things look better in terms of the economic indicators, I think it, it's a tribute to his success and his ability to pull things together. I think in a modern democracy, you know, there are always going to be very different opinions, very different currents, opposition and government, but there are important times when nations have to pull together. And I think Italy is now doing that under Prime Minister Letta's leadership. So again, welcome. I'm going to uh, invite him to give his remarks, and then we will have a discussion to which you're all going to be welcome uh, once we exchange just a few words with the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kamal. I'm really very honored to be here, and I'm very honored to be here with you, with your introduction. I will be, I will try to be very brief, because I think it's better to have a, a very substantial Q&A session. And I will try to, to raise um, one first point is about Europe, and one second point is about uh, Italy. I will start with the first one, why more European integration is needed today. And of course, my perspective is a very peculiar one because I am, I confess, I am a very pro-European Union integration. So uh, I will work very hard for next year, for the next European elections, to avoid the race of populism in Europe that is, in my view, the main risk because of the crisis, the consequences of the crisis, the consequences of the raise of uh, unemployment, youth unemployment. And we need to have uh, a strong European Union to change, to do what? Uh, my, my crucial point is about what are today the main uh, goals for Europe and the main reasons why we need Europe. We had a past in which Europe was needed because of peace. It was the, exactly the beginning of the, of the European uh, uh, integration history. But uh, today, I think we have to change the approach. Uh, I would say the, the, the image is the image of, uh, of Mitterrand and Verdun, uh, Mitterrand and Kohl, hand in hand in Verdun. That was the image of Europe, of the European integration against the war, against the idea of the war, against the, the idea of uh, coming new wars. Of course, it was also true for the 90s during the uh, ex-Yugoslavian uh, uh, war and so on. Today is not enough, and today I think we have to build a new set, a new agenda for uh, Europe. First of all, the new motivation, the new reasons why we have to push people to fight for more European uh, Union. And I will uh, suggest you just a, a small joke. Uh, when the G7 was founded in 75, we or they founded the G7 with the ranking of the main economies in the world. And at that time, it was 75, in Rambouillet, 
the seven economies were four Europeans, two North Americans, and one Japan. And of course, Europe was the center. Today, Europe is still formally the center. When I participated in my first G8 in Lockern in June, we were 10 around the table, and we were six Europeans on 10, because we were four, Italy, Germany, France, and the UK, and two representatives of the European institutions, Van Rompuy and Barroso. Six on 10. But Europe is not still the center of the world. And uh, I imagine the G7 of 2020, with the same criteria of the G7 of 1975, uh, we will not have any European country, countries there. We will have just seven countries uh, out of Europe. Europe will be there only if Europe will be united. Because, of course, in 2020, with the, the trend we are experiencing, we will have all the BRICS there and the others, no European on board. So my uh, point, my crucial point, is that we have, we, the Europeans, of course, we have to discuss about our future knowing what is the consequence of the big change in the global uh, economy and the fact that we, the Europeans, we are not the center of the world. Um, and we can have influence in the world, in the world economy, uh, in the world foreign policy, I would say, only if we, if we are united. And the, 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 the true consequence of that was, for instance, the, the crisis the Eurozone crisis we experienced. We had five years crisis. The crisis was solved, or we started to solve the crisis when Mario Draghi said, whatever it takes. But it was September uh, 12, after four years crisis, after 30 European summits, uh, and a lot of money wasted for uh, arriving to the summits without any banking union uh, tools for preventing and solving banking crisis and wasting a lot of money for uh, Irish banks, Cyprus banks, uh, Spanish banks or UK banks and so on. So there is at uh, the European level today a huge uh, political and institutional problem. And the institutional problem is, of course, what is Europe today, what are the reasons, and is Europe effective in uh, solving the problems or not? And today we are not effective. And today we need to, uh, to change uh, institutionally, in my view, radically. First of all, uh, we need to have an European leadership linked to the, to the voters. We can't have European leaders without any link with the voters. There's a problem of legitimacy, in my view, that is crucial for the future of Europe. This is why I think that uh, we need to have the president of the European Union uh, elected directly. We need to have a change of the treaties, yes, but maybe we can avoid the, tra the, the, the treaty change uh, today and next uh, May, having the president of the commission elected with the main parties, European parties, presenting a candidate and with the uh, member of, of the European Council saying, okay, we will uh, um, decide and we will uh, apply the candidate of the party winning the European elections that will be a first step to have a, a true legitimacy. Or a second step that is for me very important is we need to have just one leader of the European Union. Today I know from Washington it's not easy to say who is the European Obama. I think it's not easy. 
uh, if Obama comes to Brussels, who will meet him? Uh, many people. And I know that for uh, today's political approach, it's impossible to have this big uh, entity that is the European Union without the capability to have leadership, leadership linked to the voters, and of course able to deliver. So one second approach could be, in my view, uh, is it possible to have the two role president of the European Council, a president of the Commission, still divided in two? Why? I don't think so. I don't think it's completely necessary. We can have the same person as president of the Council and president of the Commission, for instance. That will be a sort of revolution, I know. It's not easy. But it's a way, it's a step to have a European Union more similar to something comprehensible by the citizen and not something of uh, very difficult to be understood by the citizen. So uh, my, my first point about Europe is that we need, today we, we really need to have an approach to the uh, institutional and political uh, change that we need at European level that is maybe the crucial, uh, the crucial answer to the crisis. If not, I think it will be very easy for the populistic parties to arrive to the European elections next May and to say, what is Europe? Um, who will decide in Brussels with which kind of legitimacy they will decide? And that will bring in the European institutions the main risk we, we are living is to have the most anti-European European parliament ever next May. And in my view, it's, it's a crucial risk. So we have to answer. We have to answer with radical changes, saying to the voters, OK, we understood. We need to have a European Union more democratic with a big, big uh, new legitimacy and linked uh, to, to the voters. Second point, very short about Italy. Italy will uh, be next year president of the European Union in the second semester. It will be the first uh, semester of the new European legislature, because the legislature will end uh, at the end of the Greek uh, semester in June. And we will have new, a new parliament, a new European parliament, a new commission, and we will have in uh, November a new president of the European Commission uh, or European Council. So we will start a new legislature. We are at the end of, the, of a legislature completely linked to one word. The word was austerity. Now we have to understand that uh, we need to link the next legislature to, to the word growth, and not because of we need growth against austerity. We need growth with fiscal consolidation and budget under control. But we need growth. Because if not, it will be impossible to have an European Union competitive, and it will be impossible, in my view, to sustain our welfare system and to sustain our um, demography, because we are, uh, we the Europeans, and I would say we the Italians, first of all, a country with, with a very strange demography. Uh, you know very well, and I, I don't want to, to waste time in uh, describing the strange Italian demography, but it's a huge problem. Uh, and of course, is a, a general European problem because we have the welfare that we have to sustain and we need growth to sustain welfare. I know very well that to have growth, we need structural reforms. We need to have uh, competitiveness. We need to have uh, a digital agenda uh, perfect, perfectly working, but in my view, what is absolutely necessary today is to have a European Union without walls, and we have a lot of walls inside the European Union. 
on the financial market, for instance. We don't have the correct institutions. For instance, we have the same currency, 18 countries with the same currency, without institutions at 18. The only institution at 18 is, the only true institution is the ECB. But we can't ask the ECB to play a role that is not the role of a central bank, because we are asking to, to the ECB to play a role that is a more political one, and it's not correct. So we need to have at 18, in my view, uh, a more institutional uh, framework. And of course, this is what, as uh, we, we, we uh, the Italians, we have to do. We have to be very credible in trying to push for more uh, European integration. If not, and I think we, the Italians, we can uh, do this job and we need to have this mission. Because if not, it will be very difficult. It will be very difficult for many reasons. If we don't uh, deal with the problem, first of all, we will have the UK problem. In the UK, without any change, I think they will have a referendum in some years, and the referendum will be probably negative for staying in or staying out. And my feeling is that a European Union without the UK is a worst European Union. We need to have the European Union. Uh, if we need to have the UK in the European Union, but we are uh, taking a big risk on that. Second, we need to have uh, as Italians, the credibility to stay there, to lead in the second half of next year, the European Union, able to deliver, and to deliver on, uh, on growth, on banking union, that is the second main uh, issue, because we need to have, we decided in the last European Council in June to have the banking union directives. Now we have to apply these directives, and I know there are some problems with some countries, because having the banking union applied, uh, that means no more banking crisis. But avoiding all the wars, I repeated, is one of the main problems, is a way to have European champions. And we need to have European industrial champions. Today we have national champions. And we name these national champions as European, but they are not Europeans. We have just few examples of European champions. Uh, we, we, we need to have cross borders European uh, champions. And for Italy, of course, that means credibility. Credibility means what we are trying to do. And we are trying to have a stable Italy, first of all. Why I call for stability always, because, um, because of our, I think we have to understand what was the true reason of our crisis. The reason was the fact that suddenly markets said to, to the Italians, we don't want to pay your debt. But market paid the Italian debt for decades and decades, and suddenly, market said, game over, we don't want to pay your debt. So, and of course, that, is, that was the main problem of Italy. And that was the main problem because we needed, and we need today, stability for having uh, lower interest rates. Without lower interest rates, it will be impossible to sustain our debt. And uh, lower interest rates arrive with with political stability. <coughs> Without political stability, will be, it will be impossible. This is why I call always for political stability. And I will say we reached important results. Yesterday and today, we reached the best result in, this, in the interest rates since two years and a half. The best result. Um, it is a fact. And it is, a, in my view, a very important fact. And the budget law we, we passed in the Council of Ministers uh, uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday was a budget with 
some goals. The first goal is to have, for the first time after five years, the general debt decreasing. After five years of new increasing of the debt for the first time next year, thanks to a privatization plan that we will present in the next days, we will have a decrease of the general debt. We will have a deficit among the, more, uh, the most virtuous countries in Europe. Um, we will have a 2.5 deficit. We will have, for the first time after many years, the public spending uh, decreasing and uh, the, the tax level uh, not increasing and for families and entrepreneurs to start a decrease. Of course, it's very, it's very important to repeat that we can't arrive to these goals without political stability. And this is why I was, but I stopped immediately, I was so interested in understanding what, what's happening here. The discussion in the, between tea parties, in the Republican Party and so on, it was something of very interesting for me, of course, because of the future of the discussion of, of, of the political parties and of the discussion among, uh, around the problem of, of the debt, uh, around the problem of how to deal in a bipartisan way. In Italy we have, and I'm running a grand coalition, it's not easy to run grand coalition, uh, but uh, in Germany, they are negotiating a grand coalition today. In Austria, they have a grand coalition. In Ireland, they have a grand coalition. In the Netherlands, they have a grand coalition. In Finland, today, they have a grand coalition. This is why I think that in Italy, we have to be more courageous on that. We have to work very clearly, saying the truth. The truth, of course, is that we still have this big debt, and the situation is still difficult, but we can deliver with this path, on this path, if the political stability uh, is possible. This is why I was so happy to be here, and of course to, to have these meetings uh, today, this morning, but also I will be very, very um, engaged in having these European reforms. Because I know that for a country like Italy, without an European positive perspective and without an European integration path, it will be impossible to solve our problems uh, altogether. We, the Italians, the Germans, the British, the Spanish too, it will be impossible to say alone we will be again a great power in the world of tomorrow. This is why my point, to, uh, my uh, final point is exactly a point on the future of Europe, the future of Europe and of the European countries can be a successful future only if we are more integrated. I know that it's not easy to sell to our public opinion. I know very well that it's not uh, easy, but I know very well that our future in the next three decades will depend on the decision that we will take in the next uh, months, in the next years. And the only decision that we can uh, have and can give us a future perspective will be a, f a decision on more integration. And we need leadership to explain to the people how it's so important. If not, it will be impossible to speak with the people and to demonstrate how important is the European level and to have more European integration. This is, I think, my job, first of all, and this is, first of all, the role that I want to give to Italy. Because also I know and I remember, first of all, to myself, that the, the treaties founding the European Union were signed in a city called Rome, and not by chance, I hope. Thank you. Well, 
Prime Minister, just uh, thank you very much. This was a very strong speech, a very strong pro-European and European message. Yesterday, I think it was on PBS, maybe in other forums too, you stressed that after the effort on financial sustainability and economic recovery, uh, where things are you know, cautiously optimistic, one could say, Europe-wide, but on the social side, on the unemployment side, at least in many of the southern countries, things are still very bad. And, there, and I think the, the kind of populist negative forces that you referred to obviously will, you know, will thrive on that. The unemployment rate uh, in the Eurozone is above 12% on average. In Spain and Greece, it's much worse. In Italy, it's somewhat better, but still bad. Youth unemployment is very bad. So there is this challenge of social sustainability, sustainability in terms of unemployment, jobs, young people's hopes. Do you want to say a few more words on that, how, how this could be tackled? And in particular, maybe you have some thoughts whether the new coalition in Germany, which is about to be debated, you know, may shift a little bit, not just because it includes the Social Democrats, but, but also because it's a post-election coalition, shift a little bit more to growth, to employment? Um, I think youth unemployment today is, for Italy, I'm sure this is our first nightmare. It is nightmare because of... Um, the fact that we never had in, in the last decades such a problem on, uh, on uh, youth. Today we are risking um, a lost generation. That is, of course, not only a problem of uh, welfare or a problem of uh, competitiveness, it's a cultural problem. A country without uh, the new generation driving is a country without hope. I would say, and Italy is a country obliging uh, young people to, to live and to, to find opportunities in, in, a, in Australia or here in the States or in other European countries and so on. And I'm, I'm very happy because I, I come from a past in which uh, I had the opportunity to, to study out of my country. But uh, it's not the correct way to deal with a new generation. Uh, I think my first goal today is to explain to Italy and, of course, to explain to the rest of, uh, of Europe and the rest of the world that in Italy we can have a generational change. My, you know, my, when President Napolitano asked me to form a government suddenly, uh, I, um, I had three ideas. First idea, to have uh, a very young cabinet. To demonstrate that in Italy it's possible to have young people driving. The second mission was to have the biggest number of women in the government, because Italy is a country in which we don't give enough opportunities to, to women. And the third mission was to have the first black minister in our uh, history, because I know the difference between, for instance, what I experienced when I was young and when I was at school, and uh, in my class, no one was uh, black or... Uh, we were all white and all uh, Italians. Uh, the class of my children today, they have five, seven years, is a class in which they experience what is the globalization and diversity. And for them it's very easy. Um, but Italy is a country with a big divide and we had uh, parties having a big success on the immigration problem. So we reached to have, uh, and I'm very proud of, of the work that uh, Minister Kienge is doing on that, true change 
on three main issues because of the problem of youth. And uh, my first goal in these six months were to find money to cut labor taxes on youth and to incentive uh, the youth employment. We started with, with this new measure and in uh, October we started with the new uh, this new incentive, the first results are good. We will continue on that. Uh, I'm ready, of course, to, to, to see uh, the best uh, practices in, in other countries. I was, for instance, I, I came to Austria and I came to, I will go to, to the Netherlands because the Netherlands, the, the Netherlands and Austria are the two European countries with the best performance on uh, youth employment and we will be ready to, to, to change and to apply some reforms coming from their experience because in my view it's really the nightmare and it's really the, the, the main perspective and I hope it will be the main achievement also. You had a meeting with President Obama uh, and uh, I know that the President of the United States has always been quite supportive of European growth efforts, reform efforts. Um, do you want to say a few words on, on U Europe and the U.S. and the support you're getting and you're looking forward to and why it's important for the U.S. that Europe succeeds and the kind of support you're getting from President Obama? Uh, I remember what uh, Mario Monti told me when I became Prime Minister. He, 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 in the G8 in Camp David last year, he told me how decisive was the role of President Obama there to convince the Europeans uh, to change their attitude and to be uh, more proactive on growth. And I think this meeting was the precondition to arriving to this uh, Mario Draghi's whatever it takes. So Obama was, uh, Obama's leadership was very important for, for us, for, 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 for the Europeans. Uh, and today we talked about, for instance, uh, one of the main issues, uh, and of course is, is one of our responsibilities, uh, the TTIP, the agreement, the, the trade agreement between uh, the European Union and the United States, uh, we started uh, we had the, the good news in these very days that we are quite at the end uh, of the CETA. The CETA is the Canadian-European Union agreement, trade agreement. If we sign this agreement in these very days, it would be very important to, to help, of course, the, the, the agreement with the United States. It will be very important for the future because I'm sure that the European Union and the US and Canada, we can uh, uh, work together and we can, on trade, we can reach a lot of opportunities. And I would say for Italy, first of all, because for Italy it will be very, very important. It will, Italy will be, following some studies, the country with more profit from uh, a big, a big, TTIP agreement, and I'm sure that this agreement will be, uh, will be one of uh, our uh, priorities. It will be uh, next year in the second semester, for sure, the priority of our European presidency. And today with Obama, we, we discussed about the, the dream to sign this agreement together before the end of next, uh, next year. That would be great. Now, one last question before turning to the audience, and it's a, I think it's an important question. You yourself referred to the United Kingdom, and you know, Mr. Prime Minister, that the U.S. also, I think, has sent clear messages that it would much rather have the United Kingdom stay in the European Union and, and so on. But you also mentioned the countries in the Eurozone, the need for much more greater integration, even the idea, which I think is a great idea, to have the president of the council and the president of the commission perhaps at some point be, be the same person. But there's a tension between the United Kingdom's view 
of the European Union and the Eurozones need to integrate much further. You will lead the European Union in starting the 1st of July and that, that, you know, the, that may be one of the big topics. Is there a way to have a Europe with concentric circles or with some flexibility that would accommodate the United Kingdom and keep it in the Union, but at the same time go ahead with further, much stronger integration that is needed for a common currency? How do you see that? that kind of challenge? I think we, we share the same view. I am sure that the UK have to be, we, we have to be the UK on board. I think it will be a, a big risk for the European Union to, 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 who, to be without the UK for many reasons, because we need a strong single market, a strong free market, pro-free market approach, and so on. Uh, we need to be to be a global player at that at, at global level. Um, the only way is to be more flexible, of course. But it, it can be a common interest. We, the countries with the euro, we need to have more integration among us. And I think it's... Uh, and Prime Minister Cameron actually said that in his speech. And I share his view on that. Of course, we we have different interests because we are the countries sharing the euro but after the, the experience of this of, of the last four years um, we know very well that we need a more integrated euro area if not it will be quite impossible to manage the future of of europe without uh, institutions there without banking union without uh, tools to 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 avoid crisis. So I think we can, the main problem is that we, we don't be inertial. We, we have to engage. Ex to engage the problem, yeah. Thank you very much. So now I'll open the, this gentleman first because you were ready already 10 minutes ago, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I may take a few, two or three questions together and then give the Prime Minister the floor again. Okay. Yeah. My name is Janos Papandonou. I have been Economy and Finance Minister of Greece from 1993 to 2001, and in fact responsible for better for worse for steering my country into the Eurozone. <laughs> I would like first of all to congratulate you, Prime Minister, for your, your very substantial remarks and tell you that uh, how strongly <clears throat> I'm with you on two points. First of all, that recession and unemployment are the biggest threats now for Europe and the South because they breed extremism and they threaten political stability, which is the key to our success. And secondly, I also agree that the fundamentally, the two recipes are reforms on an individual country basis and integration at the European scale. And I'm very happy that a senior European and successful European politician spoke so warmly about European integration. However, let us be realistic. I doubt, I doubt if on either front, we shall have impressive results in the short to medium term because reforms we all know from our countries and our experience are very difficult to implement, particularly in conditions of recession and mass unemployment when people don't expect to be rewarded for the, for the sacrifices which we inflict on them. And secondly, uh, European integration, you know better than I do that uh, Germany is not very warm about this anymore. France is resisting very strongly. And I doubt if there is widespread support for substantial moves in fiscal, economic, financial, and eventually political integration. So the question is, what can we do more drastically and immediately to overcome recession? My rather simplistic idea is that uh, if all these pressures we exert on Germans for eurobonds, for banking union, for this, that, or the other, are unlikely to bring fruits, then the simplest way might be, and I would like to have your opinion on this, to ask for more money from what is wrongly, I think, called a Marshall Plan for the South of Europe, to sustain demand in the South and give hope to young people, to small and medium-sized enterprises, by specific projects which would finance their activities. Would you think, and I finish, I take your note, that, would you think that it is possible to create an alliance between South and European countries, European institutions, the Commission, France perhaps, in 
pushing for such a plan now in Europe? Thank you. Thank you. I will take two, th two more. Um, let me see. Uh, somebody looks very young over there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> but please identify yourself. But yes, and yeah, good up. evening, Prime Minister. I'm Jonathan Zoni from Rome. I'm a young uh, Italian unemployed. Uh, we just obtained, uh, <laughs> that just obtained his master degree with a final grade of 110 cum laude. But maybe I'm looking for a job in the United States because there is no job in Italy. I'd like to ask you, in your opinion, uh, is it acceptable that um, a civilized country such as Italy in 2013 uh, denies a funeral and a burial to an 100 years old person that is Sir Pripke? I mean, how can uh, uh, a country that is looking forward to, to the future stay anchored to its past? Okay. Um, yes, why don't we have... Yes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Mr. Prime Minister, uh, I noticed how you, uh, in your speech, you noticed that the most important part of uh, further... Um, solving of the crisis is uh, stability. But you also mentioned that uh, it, Italy and the whole European Union is in need of growth. Uh, how do we balance these two together? Because uh, more often than not, uh, the uh, two processes can uh, often contradict and produce uh, uh, backwards results. Maybe I can okay. immediately answer on, on, on this point because, for instance, why I I call for, for stability in Italy because we have such a big debt. And it's just figures. Um, if we have this, if we pay 6% interest rates for this debt, um, is um, is, the, is the moon. If we pay 3% for this debt, it's the sun. Because is the, the difference is around uh, maybe 30 billion euros of interest rates each year. Having 30 billion euros free, I will be free to cut taxes for uh, fighting youth unemployment. If I have to pay 30 billions more for financing this uh, huge debt, for me it would be impossible, really impossible to manage the crisis. This is why for me stability is so important and this is why stability is the ally of growth. It's not the alternative because of the, I know Italy is peculiar and what I, but is exactly what, what, what we need. Uh, uh, of course, Pribke funeral was, was something of very peculiar for Italy, but uh, it was, I'm sure it, it would be peculiar in any country. It's not just an Italian problem. Uh, and on, uh, uh, on what, what you raised, I don't think is the solution, I would say, because we, we have to avoid a north-south divide in Europe. We have to uh, work together to apply structural reforms, and uh, we can have structural reforms, both in Italy or in Greece or in, uh, in Belgium or in France. Uh, we, we have different problems. I just raised the peculiar Italian problem that is completely different from others. Um, but we need to apply these reforms. For instance, what, what, what we are doing in Italy to cutting public spending, uh, I can present you Mr. Mr. Spending Review. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Italian Spending Review who is here, uh, Mr. Carlo Cottarelli, a former, I would say, 
former head of the IMF, uh, we will ask him to be the Mr. Spending Review of, of, uh, of the Italian government. He accepted. He will be on board in three days. In five days, so on, on next Tuesday. So this is news. <laughs> <laughs> he is free for five days. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, I mention and I, I take the opportunity to, to thank Carlo, Carlo Cottarelli for, this, the, for uh, accept, having accepted our, our proposal because we need to change the composition of the public uh, spending and we need to be very clear on that. Uh, because, of course, uh, we, we can't continue with uh, the, the, the historic spending and, and so on. But um, my feeling is that we can have, at European level, for instance, banking union. Why somebody will be again against banking union? In my view, it's impossible to explain that banking union is not a good solution. It is, is impossible to explain to the pub public opinion. If we have the same currency, because we, the 18, we have the same currency, we need to have a banking union. We need to have a resolution for banking crisis. We need to have uh, common answers on that. Uh, the main problem, in my view, is that we avoided to talk and to discuss publicly on these issues. And we were... We, we thought that, that uh, without public discussions, we were able to apply uh, European reforms. And it's impossible today. We need to have a frank and public discussion and to say European integration is better than European collapse. I'm ready to engage a big public discussion on that. But we need, in my view, uh, political leadership able to do that. If not, it will be for the future of, of Europe a disaster. Are there forces among the, you know, the pro-European politicians and movements to engage and, and to, count, to go against the populist anti-European voices for the European parliamentary elections? I mean, you said it's, we, we could end up with the most anti-European European parliament. So for just following up on, on But that. for instance, I, I raise what happened in Germany. Angela Merkel's leadership, um, she was able to defeat populists in yes. Germany because populists remained at 4 or 4%. Four yeah. And she won with a strong leadership, demonstrating that it's possible mm. to to have political leadership. She is pro-European, because I know she is pro-European. And uh, I think it was a good example of leadership. There's a question, yes? Over there. Then. Thank you very much. My name is Carmine Soprano. I work here for the World Bank in DC. Your Excellency, it's a great pleasure for us to be here as an Italian citizen. I'm really pleased to be having this opportunity to ask you actually two questions, not even one, if I'm allowed to. One has to do with youth unemployment, which everybody seems to be talking about. We know you've been champion on that European level, and we fought, you fought quite hard to make sure that that issue was relatively high on the EU agenda. So based on that, would you be able to anticipate two or three concrete measures that your government is planning on implementing at domestic level in the first semester of 2014 in order to encourage youth employment, especially in the southern regions of the country. And then based on that, would you be able to say what you will be willing to do in the second semester when you will assume the presidency of the EU? And the second question has to do with something that you just mentioned, which is a spending review. We're very pleased to have Mr. Spending Review in this room this afternoon. And you actually were talking about uh, the need of revisiting the composition of public spending. Now, spending cuts seems to be uh, another very popular topic in these years, yet it seems to me and to many back home, there's one cost item in the public budget 
that seems to uh, remain quite uh, protected from public spending. And that's what we call in Italy the cost of politics. And when I say that, I refer to generous parliamentarians, salaries, benefits, and uh, uh, pensions, and everything else. Now, one apparently good measure seemed to be the one that tended to reduce the number of provinces at national level, which was launched by the former government, and which seems to be stuck at the moment. So would you be able to say a little bit more in terms of whether and how you're planning on reducing public spending on the side of costs of politics? Thank you very much. Let's take two more. Do you want to? I have to answer okay. immediately. <laughs> 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 on the second question, um, first of all, three um, initiatives that my government took on, on cost of politics. The first one, uh, exactly because you, 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 you raised the point on provinces, we decided um, to be very clear to eliminate provinces. The only way is to change the constitution because the name province is in the constitution. And if we don't eliminate the name from the constitution, it will be impossible. So we presented the constitutional law for the elimination of the name constitution from uh, the name province from the constitution, and I am sure that uh, parliament will pass. Second, salaries. Uh, in Italy, we had the tradition, as <coughs> other countries, that if the prime minister or ministers are member of parliament, they have two salaries one as member of parliament and one as prime minister. I decided to, the, the day after my election to pass a law, a decree law, so a law immediately um, enforced with the elimination of the second salary. So personally I have just one and I eliminated the second for all the ministers of my government and if my successor wants to have, again, two salaries, he has to pass a law to be allowed to do that. Third, the main problem of Italian cost of politics uh, was the public law on financement of the parties. That was one of the reasons why, in my view, uh, Grillo's movement had such a big result. Because in the past we have a referendum the referendum result was very clear, and it was not applied. So my government decided to change this law and to pass from a public uh, financement of the parties without any check, uh, that was the system, to a system in which the citizen has the right to finance parties with a public incentive, with a fiscal incentive, um, and there is no other way to finance parties. And I'm very happy that yesterday, uh, after a good and positive discussion, the parliament approved this law exactly yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Now the Senate has to approve this law, and I hope the Senate will approve the law before the end of the year, and this law will be one of the radical change in the Italian. Uh, um, so I am confident that the, the page is turned on that. We are turning page, and it is not words. Uh, is um, talking about uh, facts on that, and on youth employment. Uh, one idea is to, you know, one of the, the best news of, of my day he, here was the news about the uh, possibility of uh, the U.S. to participate in the Expo 2015. Milan, it will be an important, a very important uh, challenge for us. Uh, I'm sorry because we, we won... <laughs> with, <laughs> with the Turkish Smirne yeah, right. <laughs> candidature. <Next time. laughs> uh, <clears throat> but it will be very important for us because of the subject, first of all. It would be food security, feeding the planet, 
It is a typical Italian, and uh, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a true modern subject, very positive. And also because it will be very useful for us, because we, the Italians, Kamal, we are very good, but when we have deadlines, we are better. I think that's human. <laughs> Most people are like that. Uh, so I hope the deadline to Expo 2015 will help us to, to, to reach goals and to have growth and so on. The US, the U.S. participation will be a very important news. We had the very good news of the U.K. participation one month ago. And uh, I will apply an experimental labor law on uh, this Expo 2015, and I'm sure that, on youth first of all, and I'm sure that the positive result will uh, push us and all the others to extend this uh, experimentation to, to the normal uh, discussion. And, uh, and the second one, of course, in, at European level, in my view, we have to uh, strengthen the youth guarantee. Youth guarantee is a good idea, that we raised at the European level, but uh, we, we need more money there. Uh, so my, my first goal and our first goal will be to strengthen youth guarantee. It will be, he has to become a sort of Erasmus for uh, youth employment. Erasmus was, I think, one of the best words for uh, the European Union and for the relationship between the European Union and the citizens. So now we need to have an, an Erasmus of employment, and this idea is one of them. Okay, one more question, but you know, there needs to be some gender balance in the questions, I mean. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry for all the others, but the Prime Minister will only, yes, the lady there, there that's right. I'm Please. all for gender balance. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maria Luisa Rossi Hawk, uh, News Media at TG Com, I wanted to go back, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, to your concept of stronger uh, European integration. And how are you going to reconcile that with the strong anti European sentiment that is so widespread mm -hmm. in Europe? The tension well, between the two, and what are you going to do to. Um, I, I think we, uh, we have to engage the public debate on that, and it will be a political fight. Uh, today we, we need to say very clearly what will be the consequence of the collapse of the European Union. What will be the consequence of anti-European and anti-Euro policies. Um, and we have to engage this fight saying very clearly in the European elections all the, all the assets of being in Europe, for instance, in Italy. All the legislation on environment in Italy is application of European directives. Um, if, you, if you change my statement, I can say without Europe, mm -hmm. um, Italy will be a country with many problems with the environment. And it's just an example, because of course, applying directives on environment, it's a cost. It's a cost for uh, uh, entrepreneurs, for public administration, and so on. But thanks to the European Union, we have these directives, and we have this very pro-environment uh, legislation. Uh, one second asset. Today, after five years of crisis, Italy is a country with the budget under control. After five years of crisis. Why? Thanks to Maastricht. I know I am saying something of very unpopular, but we have to be very clear. Before Maastricht, Italians, we, the Italians, we made a disaster with our debt before Maastricht. With Maastricht, we stopped raising debt and deficit. And having debt means to solve my problem with money of my children. And it was the way 
Italy solved the problem in the 70s and the, in the 80s. And this is why Italy today is in difficulty. And my mission is to say uh, never, never, never uh, debt again. And we have to stop. And I think we have to, to say maybe something, uh, something of unpopular. I know saying thanks to Maastricht is very unpopular. But before Maastricht, we had this very unpopular way to, to print money. And I don't think that printing money is the correct way to take care of our children. Well, thank you very much. I know that on behalf of all of us in the room here, you know, best wishes for success for Italy, uh, which is such a, a country that is so central in, in the world in terms of so many dimensions which so many people love. And on behalf of um, Brookings, but also the whole community here, best of luck in the many fights you said you were going to fight tonight. <laughs> and hope to have you again at some point when you have won at least two or three of those fights. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Please, let's go.